Welcome to day five of Women in Antiquity. Today we'll be talking about the Greek Dark Age and the world of Homer that arises toward the end of the Dark Age and as part of the transition into the Greece that we can see and hear. And women as they're presented in Homer, specifically uh, and especially mortal women as they're presented and in their relationships with the, uh, the men and heroes of the Iliad and the Odyssey. So, um, uh, uh, as part of our background, uh, we have left the Bronze Age, uh, and uh, the Bronze Age ends with the period of calamities. What comes after this is the 400 or so years of the Greek Dark Age, uh, which uh, during which time the Greeks have no writing system and uh, uh, are therefore uh, much more difficult for us to... Uh, uh, to hear and understand, and unfortunately, it is during the Dark Age that uh, the key foundations of the Greek society that we know that uh, that emerges from it into the archaic and classical periods, um, the, all of the the key elements of of the Greek society are formed during this period, and emerge into the light afterwards. Uh, more or less fully formed. And so um, understanding the Greeks uh, um, has to be done with a certain amount of uh, extrapolation and, uh, and speculation about uh, the, um, the drives that formed the Greek world that we know. So the Bronze Age, as I said before, collapses uh, as a result of the failure of its um, increasingly uh, um, growing uh, and interdependent industrial economy. Uh, there are four great bronze powers, uh, the Mycenaean Greeks, the Hittites, the Assyrians, and the Egyptians. And uh, the collapse seems to begin in the Aegean world um, as a result of a combination of of the um, of the bursting of the Mycenaean Bronze Age industrial economy, combined with natural disasters and the influx of a massive migration of Dorian Greeks, the second wave of Greeks into the Aegean world, um, this produces a, a domino effect which uh, brings down the economies of the other Bronze Age powers uh, and uh, um, ushers in a. Uh, a period of um, uh, of difficulty and uh, uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, enforced um, you know uh, enforced problems for all the peoples of the Eastern Mediterranean uh, and uh, the recovery that they all undergo is 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 uh, is varied and difficult. Um, the uh, the Egyptian uh, Empire collapses at this time partly due to an influx of of uh, hostile refugees from the Aegean world uh, and Anatolia, the uh, the Greeks know them as the Sea Peoples, and they call this period the period of calamities. <clears throat> and uh, as I said before, the Egyptians, um, you know, never rise to become a power or an, or an empire afterwards. Um, the transition into the Dark Age after the failure of um, of the of the Bronze uh, Age uh, economy and culture uh, happens along a number of levels, uh, and uh, one of the things that we have to bear in mind is that uh, is that the, the the Greeks are far from you know being completely um, you know defeated uh, you know culturally socially, uh, and they are also far from stagnant. Um, so, uh, you know, the idea of decline is usually what is emphasized. This decline is, uh, uh, is misunderstood and overemphasized. Um, the, uh, the main component of this is, that it is the, the, the ending of the form of urban uh, industrial economy that had been prevalent in the Bronze Age, the palace economy. And culture that was highly centralized, highly urbanized, uh, that the Mycenaean Greeks had taken over from the Minoans, uh, and with that highly centralized um, culture uh, is lost both uh, urban technologies and um, the 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 restrict uh, hierarchy of class structure 
that um, you tend to find in these very centralized, very urban societies. Um, and so the, the Greeks of the Dark Age uh, end up resettling in the countryside in, uh, in, in small, isolated agricultural communities where people are more or less on the same level. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, so there's a leveling effect, which is, which is quite real and quite profound, and is one of the things that lays the groundwork for later Greek society, is that um, the people of this community are all in the same boat. They're all peers, and they're all equally um, putting themselves at risk on behalf of the community. Um, they are all, uh, you know, equally responsible and equally privileged. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Dark Age... Um, uh, agricultural communities that that formed during this period after the collapse uh, uh, tend to have you know a a general sense of you know there are people that own property they're more or less at the same level uh, and then they choose one person among them who is to be the chieftain to help guide the community toward decisions and to lead them in times of difficulty um, and you know that chieftain becomes the only real kind of of authority. Uh, he leads the same kind of life. He's a he's a farmer uh, like all the rest of them, and a property holder. Uh, and and the only difference in his status or standing really is that uh, he has a slightly larger house with a uh, with a porch. Um, where the, um, the the property holders of the community will meet and uh, discuss the concerns of the community. <clears throat> the whole idea of depopulation and migration. Uh, depopulation has been greatly overemphasized in in past studies of the Dark Age, uh, um, and in, in fact, what actually happens is that there is uh, there is a huge influx of people and. Um, the peoples of the Dark Age, some of them leave the Aegean and, you know, and, you know, become refugees into the Egyptian Empire, as we saw. Um, but um, most of them just resettle in the countryside. And so the Aegean world is, is this, uh, is this uh, you know, uh, um, rather, rel relatively heavily settled territory. That uh, where the communities are separated from each other by water or mountain or whatever, so that these each community is isolated. But depopulation is is not really a good way to describe this. Part of the problem is one of the, uh, the you know the, it's, it's the dark age and it's difficult for us to hear, partly because they have no writing and so they have no documents, but also because um, it's also difficult for us to find out about them in terms of archaeology. Uh, and the reason for this is that um, these communities are, you know, spread out over the Greek mainland and the Peloponnese and, and, uh, 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 and you know, the Balkans and, you know, western Anatolia, uh, as well as, you know, all of these, uh, you know, uh, islands of the Aegean, some of which are very large. And it, it, we don't know where they all are. We don't know where all of these towns and villages are. And so, um, you know, when archaeologists are digging, you know, they tend to need to know where the human settlements are located. Uh, you know, they, uh, they don't, you know, dig up acres and acres at a time. They dig up, you know, small representative plots that they can, you know, from which they can extract, you know, layers of information and artifacts. And so, you know, not knowing where these small... Uh, you know, um, widely dispersed communities are means that we have relatively few in the way of actual uh, dark age towns and villages that have been excavated and analyzed in a systematic archaeological way. Uh, <clears throat> so, the other thing to note is that uh, there is a there are, are a number of things that more or less remain the same 
um, which is everything that has to do with rural ar uh, agriculture. The, you know, the agriculture that's practiced out in the countryside during the Bronze Age is more or less the same as the agricultural that's practiced you know, during the Dark Age. Uh, you know, you know, farming a small plot of land is more or less the same. Uh, the you know uh, the the difference is that uh, now these be these become these uh, conjoined uh, you know farming communities of peoples that have uh, you know that have um, you know resettled and and that these become the 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 basic element of of the Aegean world. The other thing about uh, uh, about the rural life is. Uh, in the ancient world, and especially in Greece and Rome, there are sort of two different kinds of religion, and this is something we haven't really talked about, uh, so that uh, there is sort of the, um, the religion of the, of, the, uh, of the state, the religion that has to do with, you know, the city and the conduct of public affairs. And, you know, so th this is where, you know, the great gods of the Pantheon are invoked, you know, Zeus and Athena and uh, so forth and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, out in the countryside, in the, in the farmlands, you know, the people are not concerned about uh, Zeus and Athena, um, although they might be aware of, uh, you know, of Aphrodite, of, of, of Demeter and, uh, and Kore and, you know, gods that are associated with the, the harvest. But broadly speaking, you know, people out in the countryside tend to hold to, um, uh, I hesitate to say more primitive, but less anthropomorphic, less, uh, um, you know, human-like ideas of, of the divine. Uh, people that are, are farming the land are more in touch with a more, you know, animistic, a more a spiritual idea of the potency of nature and how this manifests in, in sort of abstract ways, having to do with boundaries, having to do with, you know, land and doorways and, you know, the hearth and so forth. Uh, and, you know, it's on a much more, you know, immediate uh, daily basis being able to, you know, provide during the day and to ensure the forthcoming harvest and so forth. And so these aspects of religion, you know, remain more or less the same from, you know, from uh, across the, uh, the, the collapse into the Dark Age. Uh, and once again, you know, when we get to the Romans, we'll see that's even more true. There's an even sharper divide between the public religion uh, of, um, you know, the city of Rome and the ordinary everyday religion, you know, of people in their farmhouses. Uh, and this carries over into concepts of gender as associated with gods and goddesses. Uh, and then, you know, the really interesting thing about the Dark Age is that uh, this is a time of, of great development, uh, and and progress and you know this is partly in terms of you know tangible things that we can point to you know um, the Greeks acquire iron working during this period uh, iron is a uh, is a game changer in the ancient world uh, bronze is uh, a metal that is uh, is difficult to work and requires control of two different kinds of, of metal. It requires both copper and tin, as well as uh, um, expertise in, in its production. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, um, uh, uh, bronze is a more premium metal. Uh, bronze weapons are normally available only to the people at the top of society. Bronze tools are very expensive. And so uh, uh, the uh, society and an economy dependent on bronze needs uh, you know, both a, a constant and increasing flow of, of um, the raw materials that go into it, as well as uh, um, markets that can afford, uh, you know, bronze goods. And this is one of the reasons why the Bronze Age economy, um, you know, develops into a bubble and, uh, and collapses. Um, iron, on the other hand, is iron ore is much more common. And so as a result, uh, societies that have control of iron working technology are able to um, provide iron weapons to um, a you know wider swath of people 
uh, and uh, this leads to larger and more infantry-centric uh, uh, armies. Uh, we're talking about not just uh, knives, but also spears. And uh, uh, per, uh, allows for the availability of iron tools to a much wider segment of the populace, which leads to um, more efficient farming, which leads to higher uh, uh, you know, productivity, higher uh, agricultural yields, which leads to a better fed society, a higher standard of living, uh, um, you know, uh, lower death rates, higher birth rates. Uh, and as a result, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, a great tidal effect uh, in, in iron societies compared to bronze societies. Uh, uh, but more generally, the, the transition in the Dark Age is one of, of transition toward something. And, and uh, we'll talk more about this in a minute. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the excavations of a, of a Dark Age um, a village, and uh, we see in the inset uh, the plan for the basic uh, chieftain's hut. Uh, so you know this is a this is a, a a house much like those of the others, but it is as I said slightly larger. And toward the front is you know this sort of um, this sort of area where the the chieftain meets with the other leading members of society. Um, so the, the class structure of Dark Age society is different, with a, with a big harbinger for the future. Um, the idea of, of you know, citizens as property holders and peers. And um, the development of their culture uh, is, is different in the Dark Age. One of the things that's really striking about the Dark Age is that the Greeks are deliberately not trying to hearken back to Bronze Age culture. Bronze Age culture failed. And so what we see the Greeks of the Dark Age doing is developing uh, a, a new culture. And this is part of one of the things that I was commenting on yesterday, the idea that the Greeks are pushing toward the ideal culture from this point onward, striving to surpass um, what they have already uh, achieved, both you know, collectively and individually. And so the forms of decoration that we see in, you know, in their, uh, uh, in the ceramics, you know, ceramics are, uh, you know, pottery doesn't rot. And so it's one of the things that we're always going to have, whether intact or in pieces. And, uh, you know, the, the ceramics that we have as one of the, you know, most durable examples of how the, uh, the, the people of the Dark Age are expressing themselves is something entirely unlike both uh, the Bronze Age Greeks of the Mycenaean era and other societies around them. They're not emulating their past and they're not emulating the Easterners either. They're not emulating uh, the Mesopotamians or the Egyptians. Um, uh, what they do end up uh, um, uh, uh, what they do end up adopting from the East is once the uh, Phoenician trading system develops over the first few centuries of the of the Dark Age, uh, the Phoenicians uh, begin uh, exploring contacts with the uh, with the Greeks in the Aegean, and uh, you know from the Phoenicians, the Greeks are able to adopt uh, their version of the Phoenician alphabet, which becomes the Greek alphabet. And this happens in the middle of the eighth century. So we start to see, like this, early examples of uh, inscriptions in a in a Greek text uh, on uh, on ceramics. Uh, you know, some of them are very simple, like you know, I am the pot of you know of Theseus or something. Uh, but some of them are, you know, lines of poetry and, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, here's a closer look. And one of the interesting things about this, too, is that the development of, of the Greek alphabet is, um, happens at more or less the same time. There's a sea change across uh, the Greek world, but it is also adopted uh, in a different form. In, in different areas. And so the alphabet as it's adopted in Athens is slightly different from the alphabet that's adopted, you know, in, um, you know, in, in uh, Ionia, in, 
in uh, in Lesbos or you know uh, something like this. In other words, um, or even in in Thebes, which is not all that far from uh, from Athens. Uh, the this is partly because the dialects of Greek are slightly different from place to place. One of the things that the Greeks have in common is the Greek language, um, but uh, the the dialects uh, uh, use uh, uh, and or or avoid you know certain sounds or certain combinations of sounds uh, that are part of the ways in which the Greek cities separate themselves off and identify themselves, and so the. Uh, there's actually, you know, multiple versions of the Greek alphabet. All of this is only unified when, during the classical period, Athens sort of uh, imposes itself uh, on the Greeks as, as the cultural center of the Greek world, and especially, you know, afterwards during the uh, the Hellenic era. Um, with the the you know, with all this isolation. Uh, what is it that, that that keeps the Greeks connected? One of the things that keeps them connected is uh, is poetry. Um, they don't have the written word. They don't have books that uh, connect them to their past. They just have their collective heritage. Uh, but what they do have is uh, the the epic poetry of the rapso, the bards that uh, sing the stories of of the Greek culture. Of its past and of its present, and uh, you know the greatest of this epic poetry is is um, what later becomes commemorated as the in the uh, the stories of the the Trojan War, uh, but there is much more to it than that, and so the the stories that are told by the rhapsode, which are long and elaborate, uh, become uh, the one of the key foundations of of Greek uh, culture and society, and this is. Uh, it is through these these songs, these very long uh, 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 songs that the the rhapsodes master and pass on to their apprentices, generation to generation, for for this you know four hundred year period and more. Um, that uh, that the that the Greeks understand themselves in a very real way, uh, and so you know it seems it's it's only natural that. They would understand their relationship to the world and their relationship to the divine in terms of these uh, stories and songs as well. And this is one of the reasons why uh, the, these these epic poems become the foundation not only for Greek culture but for the Greek understanding of their uh, interrelationship with the uh, the gods and goddesses uh, of their own pantheon. Uh, there is no, you know, there is no Bible, there is no church, there are no institutions, there are no priests, there is no priestly class. All of this is very unusual for the ancient world. Most ancient societies have a priestly class. Uh, you know, in Egypt, um, the priestly class becomes politically powerful and rivals the pharaoh for influence over Egyptian society. Uh, in you know Persian society later on you know the uh, the the magi become uh, uh, so um, so secretive and so uh, um, and so uh, in control of the arcane and obscure knowledge uh, of their of their of their guild uh, that uh, that learning becomes associated with magic that's a learning and uh, um, and and religion becomes the province of these people whose uh, who who control things to such a great extent uh, in terms of religion in terms of um, intellectual congress uh, that uh, you know that uh, all to all outsiders uh, they are as much wizards as anything else but the Greeks don't have this the Greeks don't have anything like this. Um, there is public collective ownership of uh, of religion in in exactly the same way that there is public collection, collective ownership of literature and history, and and so as a result, uh, uh, you know, even these these key works like like Homer become fundamental to uh, you know to to Greek 
uh, and education and to their and become the frame of reference to everything that they understand about uh, um, about uh, uh, about what it means to be Greek. This includes the idea of uh, of arete that I mentioned in the discussion forums. Uh, the idea that uh, that um, to be Greek is to strive to surpass uh, and to drive towards the ideal, both for the individual and for the community. This also includes ideas of of gender. And, and particularly of family and marriage. Uh, so here are some of the key aspects of Homeric society in general. Uh, Homer, uh, the, the works of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, are, are, are uh, written down sometime during the 8th century. Uh, and so because these are the result of an oral tradition, the, the way oral tradition normally works is that uh, a story is told and retold from generation to generation uh, so that the, the essential elements of the story remain more or less intact, but the story is retold in a way that it, the current audience will understand. And so by the time we get to you know, the, the 8th century, you know, the 700s, uh, it's been you know, 450, 500 years uh, since the fall of Troy, uh, the, the stories, the, the epic poems about the Trojan War, uh, you know, describe the events of 500 years before, but uh, they describe them in terms of the society of, um, you know, of the audience. And so, uh, as a result, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey become uh, useful to us in, in discerning information both about the Bronze Age, where the stories are set, and the age in which the, the stories are written down uh, in describing you know, the social conventions that the people hearing the story would understand because uh, um, it's being told in, in, in their frame of reference. And so Homeric society is the society around Homer, the society of the end of the Dark Age in the 8th century. Uh, and so this Homeric society has a number of components uh, that, uh, that we can see from a number of factors, including you know, how they manifest in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Regional diversion, uh, diversity of custom and tradition. Uh, the emergence of Hellenism, the idea that, that despite all this diversity, there is a common culture that they all share throughout the Aegean world. Um, and uh, this is par partly in terms of the contrast to those who are not a part of this world, those who do not speak Greek, uh, and who are defined as you know, the, the, as the barbaroi, uh, this word literally comes from people who speak languages that sound to the Greeks like the barking of dogs, bar, bar, bar. And so the barbaroi are those who are um, not uh, as civilized as the Greeks. Uh, one of the things that you see uh, in Homer is the is the understanding that even though there is a rivalry between each Greek city, um, because they share the Greek culture, you can uh, there is an expectation of, of hospitality, and it is it is always you know mutual and balanced. So you can go to a city, um, and uh, uh, you know if you are you know if you are a prominent Athenian, you can go to uh, uh, Thebes or Corinth and and expect to be. Uh, and expect to be housed by uh, you know someone of, of of you know of that is a counterpart to you in that society, and the reverse is also true. And you are you are protected and and fed and gifted, uh, and uh, that this is a a fundamental element. This this hospitality, this uh, this benevolence toward the the stranger. Is, is a necessary uh, outgrowth 
of the 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 rivalry and and competition uh, and sometimes hostility between these uh, these communities, all of which have and and fiercely pursue their own separate identities, uh, because the you know fundamentally this this idea of of arete, this idea of of to excel beyond that which you are, uh, is is predicated on the idea of doing so through competition. Agon is the is the Greek for this. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the obvious manifestation of this is in the Olympics, which are, you know, are founded in, uh, in, the, uh, in the early 8th century, in, in, seven, uh, in 770 uh, approximately, um, 767, I think, BCE. And, you know, this is one of the things, along with the uh, acquisition of the writing system, the, the new Greek alphabet that ends the Dark Age and begins the Archaic period. The, the Olympics has a formal uh, system of athletic competition in which uh, the cities of Greece are very much in competition with each other and yet share uh, this, uh, this, this collective um, uh, pride in, in what they are able to accomplish. Uh, and so the the idea of of you know what we might call glory is 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 partly about the self, but it's about you know what you are able to achieve because your achievements are part of the advancement of your community. Uh, the your achievements are part of you know your uh, 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 accomplishment of of arete. Uh, furthers the, um, the the progress, the evolution of your city and society toward the ideal. Uh, and so, in the Iliad and the Odyssey, we see uh, we see uh, you know warfare, um, and we see you know the story of 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 the Mycenaean Greeks, uh, uh, you know. Trade imperial rivalry with with Troy across the Aegean, but we also see you know key elements of of what the bonds and connections are between uh, Greeks and and uh, and what they expect in terms of behavior, often contrasted with what uh, is expected uh, in in you know in godly behavior. Um, What we end up seeing when we talk about uh, uh, men and women in Homer uh, is is quite striking. So uh, on this diagram we have um, we have a, a number of of the uh, the key uh, gender relationships in uh, that that arise in the Iliad and the Odyssey, and one of the things that's uh, that that is is striking of, of this is that. Uh, um, Homer, time and time again, uh, uh, comes back to the marital bond as being, you know, one of the key elements of of, of society. And you know, the marital bonds are sort of of, of contrasted with each other uh, in in very striking ways. Uh, uh, the key contrast would be between, you know, Agamemnon and Clytemnestra on the one hand, and Odysseus and Penelope on the other hand. What we're going to be seeing uh, over the course of of, of uh, the, the the next uh, several meetings, you know, because this will come up over and over again in different ways, is that Odysseus and Penelope are are presented and remembered as 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 being very much you know the ideal marriage in many ways uh, and not because they're you know they're apart from each other for 20 years uh, but because they're um their uh, the marriage is one of of balance uh one in which um uh, Odysseus and Penelope are counterparts to each other we'll we'll see that again I'll talk about that a little bit more when we come to the readings. Um, 
And so this is this is contrasted with the you know the, the strife and division of Agamemnon's family, where you know Clytemnestra turns away from Agamemnon, and instead uh, pursues a relationship with Aegisthus, and you know this brings about um, uh, a number of, of negative things, including uh, the you know the the god ordained death and sacrifice of the innocent daughter of Phygenia, and the equally god ordained. Um, murder of Clytemnestra by Orestes, and Orestes ends up subsequently being, you know, hounded by uh, um, the Furies uh, for murder, the murder of his mother, even though it was ordered by Apollo. Uh, we'll see more of that when we uh, when we look at the excerpt from the play, The Furies, which deals with this. Uh, uh, and so, and 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 the interesting thing about this is that it, you know, Clytemnestra is. Uh, is is a fascinating figure because, you know, through all of this, you know, you, it's it's uh, compelling to see her as a villain, and yet, uh, at the same time, she is, uh, you know, she is more um, self possessed, and and in many ways uh, uh, wiser and and more proactive. Than Agamemnon is, and Agamemnon certainly is not presented as being, you know, any kind of, of ideal man. The ideal men in the story are, uh, you know, Odysseus and one might say Hector, uh, and, and even uh, uh, you know Odysseus is, uh, you know, the story of of the Iliad and, and the Odyssey. Is partly having to do with uh, the pride that that uh, Odysseus uh, is susceptible to, which you know brings is one of the things that brings about the punishment that is provided to, to him by the gods of uh, you know his separation and wandering before he's finally able to return home. Uh, we see in in Hector and uh, Andromache. A, uh, a a more straightforward and mundane you know presentation of the uh, of the balance between uh, you know the the husband and the wife you know the the you know Hector has his work to do which is going to war and attempting to save Troy and Andromache has her work to do which has to do with uh, uh, you know household responsibilities. And there's a passage about, about this, which we'll come to uh, later, which uh, which sort of emphasizes this and is sort of easy to take as a, as a negative, um, but uh, has to do with you know male and female you know responsibilities being connected by the marriage bond. So. Uh, you know, taking a look at the, the readings individually uh, very quickly, uh, Agamemnon's insult is, is very short. Uh, it uh, primarily concerns the, uh, the, the noble woman, uh, Briseis, who is uh, claimed as a prize uh, by the Greeks uh, during one of their raids and uh, becomes a bone of contention between uh, Agamemnon and uh, Achilles, What's really important here is that you know, you know, Briseis is is, uh, if you'll pardon the expression, booty. But uh, you know what's uh, what's key is to think about when you read a story like this. Why is this story being told? The story is being told not to degrade Briseis. Briseis is being uh, degraded by the Greeks because the Greeks are being filled with pride. Uh, you know, Agamemnon and Achilles are expressing different kinds of pride uh, here, and uh, the the outcome of this is is punishment by the gods for their for their hubris. This is one of the ways in which the gods are most active in Greek mythology, is to respond to the 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 kinds of actions, behaviors, and emotions of of mortal men and women that are that have negative impacts on society, so uh, you know greed, selfishness, pride, ambition. These are the things that are punished by the gods. 
the, it's, and it's very interesting that the gods of the Greeks should be so concerned with, you know, behavior by humans that doesn't affect them, but is negative for the community. The gods are presented as being, uh, uh, as reinforcing human morality. And so, you know, even from an early stage, the gods perform this sort of, of symbolic function. The gods are performing uh, a, a function that is a, a supernatural uh, um, reinforcement of the rules that humans have made for themselves for the benefits of humans. Uh, and so already the Greeks have have moved beyond the the you know the basic motivations uh, of ancient peoples in terms of religion, which is a which is an attempt to uh, uh, in, in, uh, minimize the the chaos and uh, and confusion uh, and of the potency of the wild of nature uh, by you know ordering it and categorizing. It. And giving it names, and and so in that way, uh, uh, you know, uh, imposing order, and 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 uh, empowering themselves as a result. This is the the, the basic uh, element of ancient religion. But the Greeks have taken this further, and co-opted the the forces of the divine for the improvement of uh, of human communities. And that is, in and of itself, um, you know, uh, unique and remarkable. The story of Nausicaa and the stranger. The stranger, of course, is Odysseus. And, uh, you know, this is a cute story. Uh, this is, you know, this is, you know, illustrating uh, uh, some of the, you know, the... Uh, some of the the ways in which you know people would be assumed to act in unusual situations in uh, in Homeric society, society at the end of the Dark Age. Um, but there are some other uh, interesting aspects of this uh, story as well. Um, and uh, in particular, as you look at this, you want to look at uh, how Nausicaa's father and mother are portrayed as the rulers of Nausicaa's community. And uh, you know how you know they uh, balance each other and, and interact with each other. So take a look at that. Uh, the artifice of Penelope, of course, uh, you know if you have any awareness of of the Odyssey at all, you know that while uh, Odysseus is, is is wandering the Mediterranean for you know for twenty years, uh, his wife Penelope is back home. Uh, and trying to fend off the leading men of the community who are you know seeking to wed her and you know take ownership of the lands that uh, belong to Odysseus and so uh, you know part of this is is about uh, you know what the strategies that Penelope uses to hold them off uh, interestingly enough the the son Telemachus seems to be relatively powerless to to do anything about the way her his mother is being treated. It's it's all on the shoulders of Penelope to uh, to preserve things intact for uh, Odysseus to come home to. But once Odysseus does come home, uh, there are uh, there are some key moments in which, um, uh, you know, Odysseus and Penelope, once they are reunited, uh, express the, um, the, the parity of their marriage bond. Um, they are not uh, equals because they have different kinds of responsibilities to the family and to the community, um, but they are balanced. And, uh, and the... The, the nature of this balance is, is infused into the story. It's one of the things that Homer is trying to get across in, in telling the story, that this is a, a key element of Greek society. Uh, okay, so the Arthur is, uh, is one of our longer articles, um, and uh, it, it's worth a look, but the main thing that uh, I wanted to point out for you is... Um, 
it's uh, it's in here that we see the uh, uh, the discussion of uh, Hector and Andromache, uh, and uh, the you know the you know the nature of that uh, that uh, that relationship is explored. Um, we also see you know what happens later on in uh, uh, during the Archaic period is that uh, Athens across the Archaic period and into the Classical period, so the period, you know, the, the next few centuries after the Dark Age, uh, Athens is undergoing this constant evolution, which, you know, in retrospect seems to be moving toward its, uh, its radical experiment in pure democracy that it finally achieves uh, in the 5th century. And, uh, and so there are a number of stages of this in which... Uh, in which uh, Athenian society is being constantly reformed, and uh, you know the the rules of society are constantly changing, and you know the extent to which that affects women, we'll be looking at uh, you know um, over the the next couple of days. But uh, uh, you know the the reforms that are. Uh, that are accomplished in order to make these changes, you know, the, some of them, you know, one generation to the next, uh, you know, generally speaking, aren't about, you know, men and women uh, so much as, uh, you know, as the the way society is organized and the way that the government is organized, the, the effects um, on gender are you know secondary outcomes they're fallout from the the evolution that Athens undergoes so we see some of that in 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 this article the discussion of Solon one of the great lawgivers of of Athens who undertakes you know one of these sets of reforms uh, and we'll be seeing more of that over the next uh, of our uh, other discussions of 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 the Greek world and and of Athens in particular the ordinary article is is very interesting, and if you're at all interested in the in the in the biological aspect of this, uh, uh, you know, of the idea of gender roles, and this is one of the uh, term paper questions, so you know, you might very well be wanting to, to sort of think about this and, and maybe look at this article if this appeals to you or if you find it intriguing, or, or conversely, if you find it uh, you know repulsive uh, to think this way, uh, uh, but. Um, one of the things that's that's unavoidable, you know, not only do we have the idea that that women are di women are different biologically, but the the way in which this affects, you know, how society and culture thinks about women, uh, you know, deserves a lot of discussion. Some of what uh, Ortner says in the beginning is is way too categorical, you know, where you know she talks about, you know, all societies women are repressed. Uh, that's simply not true, um, especially if you look at, you know, the balance between male and female responsibilities, public, private, present, future. Uh, the idea of the of repression and subordination is vastly uh, uh, exaggerated by people who want to see misogyny and who want to impose modern values on ancient cultures. Ancient cultures have to be judged in their own terms. Uh, that said, you know some of the things that are raised in this article are are very interesting. Not only is there a um, uh, the 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 point about women's social role uh, as being seen as closer to nature, uh, but uh, the idea of the women's psyche as being seen as closer to nature. So in other words, women are capable of doing biological things that men are not. And this, this for men makes women the other, makes women capable of much more in tune with nature. They do natural things that men cannot. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so uh, because, as I've said, nature has an a ununderstandable potency uh, nature itself is powerful and obscure. Uh, there's a uh, there's a a supernatural aspect to this. Um, uh, so you know, not only are you know are women potentially more in touch with the natural world, which is which includes the wild, which includes 
nature and chaos, uh, you know, this, uh, um, this, uh, this is one of the reasons why, you know, fertility, obviously fertility is, is always seen as, a, uh, as something associated with female divinities, not only Mother Earth, but uh, uh, fertility goddesses like Ishtar uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and Demeter. Um, but uh, you know, we take this further, and and there's you know there is the capacity for for mysticism. There's a capacity for uh, you know uh, women being you know more uh, attuned to the occult, and uh, we'll see this uh, especially if a woman is a foreigner, and so even more the other. Uh, there's a possibility of. Of you know of association of of witchcraft with women, um, which we see in most famously Medea. We'll be talking about Medea in a couple of days, um, but uh, this this carries forward into you know, into Western civilization in many ways. Uh, and, and so this is one of the things that uh, that creates the disconnect between men and women. Of course, is not just the the simple biological differences, but all the things that uh, that uh, emerge from this as a result of you know uh, of men seeing women as the other. Uh, the uh, the Dowden article is uh, uh, is an important reminder that that uh, mythology can't be mapped onto Greek society. Uh, there is a uh, there are serious difficulties in looking at uh, mythology or even you know. Uh, Greek literature about mortals, uh, which includes Iliad and Odyssey, as well as uh, you know uh, tragedy, com comedy, and other uh, you know forms of poetry that we'll be looking at later, uh, because these are stories that are told to um, to create scenarios that uh, that express um, you know cultural bylaws, but. Uh, often through their violation or through the creation of individuals or circumstances that are that are unreal in order to highlight and, and put into relief uh, that which is expected normal. Uh, and so, you know, the uh, this is an interesting article for, for looking at a couple of, of specific examples of this, uh, particularly with respect to... Uh, to Clytemnestra, uh, you know, if you want, if you want my advice, you know, whether during this course or later, you want to look at everything that you can about Clytemnestra because uh, she is is a polarizing figure, and in terms of you know gender in Homer, and in you know in Greek tragedy of later generations, uh, you know, there are a number of of you know Clytemnestra provides a number of of, of very uh, striking, um, you know, uh, jumping off points for making arguments about uh, the, the Greek relationship with, uh, with gender, with maternity, and so forth. And, uh, and finally, uh, the, uh, the divided world of Iliad 6 uh, is, uh, um, discusses a number of... Um, of uh, women and uh, relationships that are presented in Homer, including uh, there's more here about Hector and Andromache, uh, and the um, uh, and and attempts to draw some conclusions about uh, how Homer is depicting uh, marital relationships and relationships between men and women in general. So take a look at these readings, and I'm very much uh, interested in, in hearing your responses in the forums uh, on, uh, uh, you know, on, on, uh, on, you know, on uh, Odysseus and uh, Penelope, on Hector and Andromache, on, you know, uh, Priam and, and, uh, and Hecuba, and, uh, and, you know, Briseis and, and uh, Cassandra, and... You know, for that matter, Helen, you know, one of the things that always ends up happening about, uh, you know, in terms of the Trojan War is that uh, Helen gets the blame for starting all of this, 
but uh, you know she tends to get lost in the shuffle as we talk about all of these other um, all of these other you know moments of heroism and and, and you know uh, moments of 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 unheroism as well. So uh, take a look at all these things, and I'll uh, see you in the discussion forums. Perseus, who is uh, claimed as a prize uh, by the Greeks uh, during one of their raids, and uh, becomes a bone of contention between uh, Agamemnon and uh, Achilles. What's really important here is that, you know, you know, Briseis is, is uh, if you'll pardon the expression, booty. But, uh, you know, what's, uh, what's key is to think about when you read a story like this, why is this story being told? The story is being told not to degrade Briseis. Briseis is being uh, degraded by the Greeks because the Greeks are being filled with pride. Uh, you know, Agamemnon and Achilles are expressing it different kinds of pride uh, here and uh, the the outcome of this is is punishment by the gods for their for their hubris this is one of the ways in which the gods are most active in greek mythology is to respond to the 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 kinds of actions and behaviors and emotions of of mortal men and women that are that have negative impacts on society. So, uh, you know, greed, selfishness, pride, ambition, these are the things that are punished by the gods. The, it's, and it's very interesting that the gods of the Greeks should be so concerned with, you know, behavior by humans that doesn't affect them, but is negative for the community. The gods are presented as being uh, uh, as reinforcing human morality. And so, you know, even from an early stage, the gods perform this sort of, of symbolic function. Uh, uh, the gods are performing uh, a, a function that is a, a supernatural uh, um, reinforcement of the rules that humans have made for themselves for the benefits of humans. Uh, and so already the Greeks have have moved beyond the the you know the basic motivations uh, of ancient peoples in terms of religion, which is a which is an attempt to uh, uh, in, in, uh, minimize the the chaos and uh, and confusion uh, and of the potency of the wild of nature uh, by you know ordering it and categorizing. It. And giving it names, and and so in that way, uh, uh, you know, uh, imposing order, and 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 uh, empowering themselves as a result is that uh, there is a there are, are a number of things that more or less remain the same. Um, which is everything that has to do with rural ar uh, agriculture, the you know the agriculture that's practiced out in the countryside during the Bronze Age is more or less the same as the agricultural that's practiced you know during the Dark Age. Uh, you know you know farming a small plot of land is more or less the same. Uh, the you know uh, the the difference is that uh, now these be these become. These uh, conjoined, uh, you know, farming communities of peoples that have, uh, you know, that have, um, you know, resettled and and that these become the 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 basic element of of the Aegean world. The other thing about uh, uh, about the rural life is uh, in the ancient world and especially in Greece and Rome, there are sort of two different kinds of religion, and this is something we haven't really talked about. Uh, so that uh, there is sort of the um, the religion of the of the uh, of the state, the religion that has to do with you know the city and the conduct of public affairs, and you know so th this is where you know the great gods of the pantheon are invoked, you know Zeus and Athena and uh, so forth and so on. 
Uh, but uh, uh, out in the countryside, in the in the farmlands, you know, the people are not concerned about uh, Zeus and Athena, um, although they might be aware of uh, you know of Aphrodite, of of, of Demeter and uh, and Kore and you know gods that are associated with the the harvest. But broadly speaking, you know, people out in the countryside tend to hold to. Um, uh, I hesitate to say more primitive, but less anthropomorphic, less, uh, um, you know, human-like ideas of, of the divine. Uh, people that are, are farming the land are more in touch with a more, you know, animistic, a more uh, spiritual idea of the potency of nature and how this manifests in, in sort of abstract ways, having to do with boundaries, having to do with you know, land and doorways and, you know, the hearth and so forth. Uh, and, you know, it's on a much more, you know, immediate uh, daily basis being able to, you know, provide during the day and to ensure the forthcoming harvest and so forth. And so these aspects of religion, you know, remain more or less the same from, you know, from... Uh, uh, and even, uh, uh, you know, Odysseus is, uh, you know, the story of, of the Iliad and, and the Odyssey is partly having to do with uh, the pride that, that uh, Odysseus uh, is susceptible to, which, you know, brings, is one of the things that brings about the punishment that is provided to, to him by the gods of uh, you know, his separation and wandering before he's finally able to return home. Uh, we see in, in Hector and uh, Andromache a, uh, a, a more straightforward and mundane, you know, presentation of the, uh, of the balance between, uh, you know, the, the husband and the wife. You know, the, the you know, Hector has his work to do, which is going to war and attempting to save Troy, and Andromache has her work to do, which has to do with, uh, uh, you know, household responsibilities. And there's a passage about, about this, which we'll come to uh, later, which, uh, which sort of emphasizes this and is sort of easy to take as, uh, as a negative, um, but uh, has to do with, you know, male and female, you know, responsibilities being connected by the marriage bond. So, uh, you know, taking a look at the, the readings individually, uh, very quickly, uh, Agamemnon's insult is, is very short. Uh, it uh, primarily concerns the, uh, the, the noble woman, uh, Briseis, who is uh, claimed as a prize, uh, by the Greeks uh, during one of their raids and uh, becomes a bone of contention between uh, Agamemnon and uh, Achilles. What's really important here is that, you know, you know, uh, Briseis is, is uh, if you'll pardon the expression, booty. But, uh, you know, what's... Uh, What's key is to think about when you read a story like this, why is this story being told? The story is being told not to degrade Briseis. Briseis is being uh, degraded by the Greeks because the Greeks are being filled with pride. Uh, you know, Agamemnon and Achilles are expressing different kinds of pride uh, here, and uh, the, the outcome of this is is punishment by the gods for their for their hubris. This is one of the ways in which the gods are most active in Greek mythology is to respond to the 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 kind of simple biological differences but all the things that uh, that uh, emerge from this as a result of you know uh, of men seeing women as the other. Uh, the uh, the doubt in article is uh, uh, is an important reminder that that uh, mythology can't be mapped onto Greek society. Uh, there is a uh, there are serious difficulties in looking at uh, mythology or even 
you know, uh, Greek literature about mortals, uh, which includes Iliad and Odyssey, as well as, uh, you know, uh, tragedy, com comedy, and other, uh, you know, forms of poetry that we'll be looking at later. Uh, because these are stories that are told to, um, to create scenarios that, uh, that express... Um, you know, cultural bylaws, but uh, often through their violation or through the creation of individuals or circumstances that are that are unreal in order to highlight and, and put into relief uh, that which is expected and normal. Uh, and so, you know, the... Uh, this is an interesting article for, for looking at a couple of, of specific examples of this, uh, particularly with respect to uh, to Clytemnestra. Uh, you know, if you want if you want my advice, you know, whether during this course or later, you want to look at everything that you can about Clytemnestra because uh, she is is a polarizing figure, and in terms of you know gender and Homer. And in you know in Greek tragedy of later generations, uh, you know there are a number of of you know Clytemnestra provides a number of of, of very uh, striking um, you know uh, jumping off points for making arguments about uh, the the Greek relationship with uh, with gender with maternity and so forth. And uh, and finally uh, the. Uh, the divided world of Iliad six uh, is uh, um, discusses a number of um, of uh, women and uh, relationships that are presented in Homer, including uh, there's more here about Hector and Andromache, uh, and the. Um, uh, and, and attempts to draw some conclusions about uh, how Homer is depicting uh, marital relationships and relationships between men and women in general. Uh, and, you know, it's on a much more, you know, immediate uh, daily basis being able to, you know, provide during the day and to ensure the forthcoming harvest and so forth. And so these aspects of religion, you know, remain more or less the same from, you know, from uh, across the, uh, the the collapse into the Dark Age. Uh, and once again, you know, when we get to the Romans, we'll see that's even more true. There's an even sharper divide between the public religion uh, of, um, you know, the city of Rome and the ordinary everyday religion, you know, of people in their farmhouses. Uh, and this carries over into concepts of gender as associated with gods and goddesses. Uh, and then, you know, the really interesting thing about the Dark Age is that uh, this is a time of, of great development uh, and, and progress. And, you know, this is partly in terms of, you know, tangible things that we can point to. You know, um, the Greeks acquire ironworking during this period. Uh, iron is a... Uh, is a game changer in the ancient world. Uh, bronze is uh, a metal that is uh, is difficult to work and requires control of two different kinds of, of metal. It requires both copper and tin, as well as uh, um, expertise in in its production. Uh, and uh, and so. Uh, um, uh, uh, bronze is a more premium metal. Uh, bronze weapons are normally available only to the people at the top of society. Bronze tools are very expensive, and so uh, uh, the uh, society and an economy dependent on bronze needs, uh, you know, both a, a constant and increasing flow of of um, the raw materials that go into it, as well as. Uh, um, markets that can afford, uh, you know, bronze goods, and this is one of the reasons why the Bronze Age economy, um, you know, develops into a bubble and uh, and collapses. Um, iron, on the other hand, is iron ore is much more common, and so as a result, uh, societies that have control of iron working technology are able to um, provide iron weapons to um, a you know, wider swath of people, 
Uh, and uh, this leads to larger and more infantry-centric uh, uh, armies. Uh, we're talking about not just uh, knives, but also spears. And uh, uh, pro uh, allows for the availability of iron tools to a much wider segment of the populace, which leads to um, more efficient farming, which leads to higher uh, uh, you know, productivity, higher uh, agricultural yield. Um, they don't have the written word. They don't have books that uh, connect them to their past. They just have their collective heritage. Uh, but what they do have is uh, the, the epic poetry of the rapso, the bards that... Uh, sing the stories of of the Greek culture, of its past and of its present, and uh, you know the greatest of this epic poetry is is um, what later becomes commemorated as the in the uh, the stories of the the Trojan War, uh, but there is much more to it than that, and so the the stories that are told by the rhapsode, which are long and elaborate, uh, become. Uh, the one of the key foundations of, of Greek uh, culture and society, and this is uh, it is through these these songs, these very long uh, uh, songs that the the rhapsodes master and pass on to their apprentices, generation to generation for for this you know four hundred year period and more. Um, that uh, that the that the Greeks understand themselves in a very real way, uh, and so you know it seems it's it's only natural that they would understand their relationship to the world and their relationship to the divine in terms of these uh, stories and songs as well. And this is one of the reasons why uh, the, these these epic poems become the foundation not only for Greek culture, but for the Greek understanding of their uh, interrelationship with the, uh, the gods and goddesses uh, of their own pantheon. Uh, there is no, you know, there is no Bible, there is no church, there are no institutions, there are no priests, there is no priestly class. All of this is very unusual for the ancient world. Most ancient societies have a priestly class. Uh, you know, in Egypt, um, the priestly class becomes politically powerful and rivals the pharaoh for influence over Egyptian society. Uh, in you know Persian society, later on, you know the uh, the the magi become uh, uh, so um, so secretive and so. Uh, um, and so uh, in control of the arcane and obscure knowledge uh, of their of their of their guild uh, that uh, that learning becomes associated with magic that uh, learning and uh, um, and and religion becomes the province of these people whose uh, who who control things to such a great extent. Uh, in terms of religion, in terms of um, intellectual that have been excavated and analyzed in a systematic archaeological way. Uh, <clears throat> so, the other thing to note is that uh, there is a, there are, are a number of things that more or less remain the same. Um, which is everything that has to do with rural ar uh, agriculture, the you know the agriculture that's practiced out in the countryside during the Bronze Age is more or less the same as the agricultural that's practiced you know during the Dark Age. Uh, you know you know farming a small plot of land is more or less the same. Uh, the you know uh, the the difference is that uh, now these be these become. These uh, conjoined, uh, you know, farming communities of peoples that have, uh, you know, that have, um, you know, resettled and and that these become the 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 basic element of of the Aegean world. The other thing about uh, uh, about the rural life is uh, in the ancient world and especially in Greece and Rome, there are sort of two different kinds of religion, and this is something we haven't really talked about. Uh, so that uh, there is sort of the um, the religion of the 
of the uh, of the state, the religion that has to do with, you know, the city and the conduct of public affairs. And, you know, so th this is where, you know, the great gods of the pantheon are invoked, you know, Zeus and Athena and uh, so forth and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, out in the countryside, in the in the farmlands, you know, the people are not concerned about uh, Zeus and Athena, um, although they might be aware of, uh, you know, of Aphrodite, of of, uh, of Demeter and uh, and Kore and you know gods that are associated with the, the harvest. But broadly speaking, you know, people out in the countryside tend to hold to. Um, uh, I hesitate to say more primitive, but less anthropomorphic, less, uh, um, you know, human-like ideas of, of the divine. Uh, people that are, are farming the land are more in touch with a more, you know, animistic, a more uh, spiritual idea of the potency of nature and how this manifests in, in sort of abstract ways, having to do with boundaries, having to do with you know, land and doorways and, you know, the hearth and so forth. Uh, and, you know, it's on a much more, you know, immediate uh, daily basis being able to, you know, provide, during, founded in, uh, in, the, uh, in the early 8th century, in, in, seven, uh, in 770 uh, approximately, um, 767, I think, BCE. And, you know, this is one of the things, along with the uh, acquisition of the writing system, the, the New Greek alphabet, that ends the Dark Age and begins the Archaic period. The, the Olympics has a formal uh, system of athletic competition in which uh, the cities of Greece are very much in competition with each other and yet share uh, this, uh, this, this collective um, uh, pride in in what they are able to accomplish. Uh, and so the, the idea of, of, you know, what we might call glory is, is, is partly about the self, but it's about, you know, what you are able to achieve because your achievements are part of the advancement of your community. Uh, the your achievements are part of, you know, your uh, 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 accomplishment of of arete uh, furthers the, um, the the progress, the evolution of your city and society toward the ideal. Uh, and so, in the Iliad and the Odyssey, we see uh, we see uh, you know warfare. Um, and we see, you know, the story of of, of the Mycenaean Greeks, uh, uh, you know, trade imperial rivalry with with Troy across the Aegean. But we also see, you know, key elements of of what the bonds and connections are between uh, Greeks and and uh, and what they expect in terms of behavior, often contrasted with what uh, is expected. Uh, in in you know in godly behavior, um, what we end up seeing when we talk about uh, uh, men and women in Homer uh, is is quite striking. So uh, on this diagram we have um, we have a, a number of of the uh, the key uh, gender relationships in. Uh, that that arise in the Iliad and the Odyssey, and one of the things that's uh, that that uh, is is striking uh, uh, of this is that uh, um, Homer, time and time again, uh, uh, comes back to the marital bond as being, you know, one of the key elements of of of. Um, uh, agricultural communities that that formed during this period after the collapse uh, uh, tend to have you know a a general sense of you know there are people that own property they're more or less at the same level uh, and then they choose one person among them who is to be the chieftain to help guide the community toward decisions and to lead them in times of difficulty um, 
and you know that chieftain becomes the only real kind of of authority. Uh, he leads the same kind of life. He's a he's a farmer uh, like all the rest of them, and a property holder. Uh, and and the only difference in his status or standing really is that uh, he has a slightly larger house with a uh, with a porch um, where the, um, the the property holders of the community will meet and uh, discuss the concerns of the community. <clears throat> the whole idea of depopulation and migration. Uh, depopulation has been greatly overemphasized in in past studies of the Dark Age, uh, um, and in, in fact, what actually happens is that there is uh, there is a huge influx of people, and um, the peoples of the Dark Age, some of them leave the Aegean, and you know, and you know, become refugees into the Egyptian Empire, as we saw. Um, but um, most of them just resettle in the countryside, and so the Aegean world is is this uh, is this uh, you know uh, um, rather, rather, relatively heavily settled territory that uh, where the communities are separated from each other by water or mountain or whatever, so that these each community is isolated. But depopulation is is not really a good way to describe this. Part of the problem is one of the, uh, the you know the, it's, it's the Dark Age and it's difficult for us to hear, partly because they have no writing and so they have no documents, but also because um, it's also difficult for us to find out about them in terms of archaeology. Uh, and the reason for this is that um, these communities are you know spread out over the Greek mainland and the Peloponnese and and. Uh, 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 and you know the Balkans and you know Western Anatolia, uh, as well as you know all of these uh, you know uh, islands of the Aegean, some of which are very large, and it, it we don't know where they all are. We don't know where all of these towns and villages are, and so um, you know when archaeologists are digging, you know they tend to need to know where the human settlements are located. Uh, you know, they uh, they don't, you know, dig up acres and acres at a time. They dig up, you know, posing order and 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 uh, empowering themselves as a result. This is the, the, the basic uh, element of ancient religion, but the Greeks have taken this further and co-opted the, the forces of the divine for the improvement of... Uh, of human communities, and that is in and of itself, um, you know, uh, unique and remarkable. The story of Nausicaa and the stranger. The stranger, of course, is Odysseus, and uh, you know, this is a cute story. Uh, this is, you know, this is, you know, illustrating uh, uh, some of the, you know, the. Uh, some of the the ways in which you know people would be assumed to act in unusual situations in uh, in Homeric society, society at the end of the Dark Age. Um, but there are some other uh, interesting aspects of this uh, story as well. Um, and uh, in particular, as you look at this, you want to look at uh, how Nausicaa's father and mother are portrayed as the rulers of Nausicaa's community. And uh, you know how you know they uh, balance each other and, and interact with each other. So take a look at that. Uh, the artifice of Penelope, of course. Uh, you know, if you have any awareness of of the Odyssey at all, you know that while Ho uh, Odysseus is, is is wandering the Mediterranean for you know for twenty years, uh, his wife Penelope is back home. Uh, and trying to fend off the leading men of the community who are you know seeking to wed her and you know take ownership of the land that uh, belonged to Odysseus and so uh, you know part of this is is about uh, you know what the strategies that Penelope uses to hold them off uh, interestingly enough the the son Telemachus seems to be relatively powerless to to do anything about the way her his mother is being treated. It's it's all on the shoulders of Penelope to uh, to preserve things 
intact for uh, Odysseus to come home to. But once Odysseus does come home, uh, there are uh, there are some key moments in which um, uh, you know Odysseus and Penelope, once they are reunited, uh, express the um, the the parity of their marriage bond. Um, they are not uh, equals because they have different kinds of responsibilities to the family. We have as one of the you know most durable examples of how the uh, the the people of the Dark Age are expressing themselves is something entirely unlike both uh, the Bronze Age Greeks of the Mycenaean era and other societies around them. They're not emulating their past, and they're not emulating the Easterners either. They're not emulating uh, the Mesopotamians or the Egyptians. Um, uh, what they do end up, uh, um, uh, uh, what they do end up adopting from the East is once the uh, Phoenician trading system develops over the first few centuries of the, of the Dark Age, uh, the Phoenicians uh, begin uh, exploring contacts with the uh, with the Greeks in the Aegean, and uh, you know from the Phoenicians, the Greeks are able to adopt uh, their version of the Phoenician alphabet, which becomes the Greek alphabet. And this happens in the middle of the eighth century. So we start to see like this early examples of uh, inscriptions in a in a Greek text. Uh, on uh, on ceramics, uh, you know, some of them are very simple, like you know, I am the pot of you know of Theseus or something. Uh, but some of them are you know lines of poetry and uh, you know things like that. Uh, here's a closer look, and one of the interesting things about this too is that the development of of the Greek alphabet is. Um, happens at more or less the same time. There's a sea change across uh, the Greek world, but it is also adopted uh, in a different form in, in different areas. And so the alphabet, as it's adopted in Athens, is slightly different from the alphabet that's adopted you know, in, um, you know, in, in uh, Ionia, in, in uh, in Lesbos, or you know, uh, something like this. In other words, um, or even in in Thebes, which is not all that far from uh, from Athens. Uh, the this is partly because the dialects of Greek are slightly different from place to place. One of the things that the Greeks have in common is the Greek language, um, but uh, the the dialects. Uh, uh, use uh, and or or avoid, you know, certain sounds or certain combinations of sounds uh, that are part of the ways in which the Greek cities separate themselves off and identify themselves. And so the uh, there is actually you know multiple versions of the Greek alphabet. All of this is only unified when during the classical period Athens sort of uh, imposes itself as a, a empire collapses at this time partly due to an influx of of uh, hostile refugees from the Aegean world uh, and Anatolia the uh, the Greeks know them as the sea peoples and they call this period the period of calamities <clears throat> and uh, as I said before the Egyptians um, you know never rise to become a power or an, or an empire afterwards um, the transition into the Dark Age after the failure of um, of the of the Bronze uh, Age uh, economy and culture uh, happens along a number of levels, uh, and uh, one of the things that we have to bear in mind is that uh, is that the, the the Greeks are far from you know being completely. Um, you know, defeated, uh, you know, culturally, socially, uh, and they are also far from stagnant. Um, so, uh, you know, the idea of decline is usually what is emphasized. This decline is uh, uh, is misunderstood and overemphasized. Um, the uh, The main component of this is that is the the, the ending of 
the form of urban uh, industrial economy that had been prevalent in the Bronze Age, the palace economy and culture that was highly centralized, highly urbanized, uh, that the Mycenaean Greeks had taken over from the Minoans. Uh, and with that highly centralized um, culture uh, is lost both uh, urban technologies and um, the, 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 the restrict a uh, hierarchy of class structure that um, you tend to find in these very centralized, very urban societies. Um, and so the, the Greeks of the Dark Age uh, end up resettling in the countryside in, uh, in, in small, isolated agricultural communities where people are more or less on the same level. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, so there's a leveling effect which is, which is quite real and quite profound and is one of the things that lays the groundwork for later Greek society is that um, the people of this community are all in the same boat. They're all peers and they're all equally um, putting themselves at risk on behalf of the community. Um, they are all, uh, you know, equally responsible and equally privileged. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Dark Age... Um, uh, agricultural communities that that formed during this period after the collapse uh, uh, tend to have, you know, a, 